Good morning, Highline. First, a big shout out to the Unity Week team who's holding it down at the back end of this presentation for us all. It is my honor to introduce our Unity Week speaker, Tochi Onyebuchi. When discussing the theme, Reclaiming Education and Honoring Resilience, our committee examined where our community stood at this current moment in time. Tochi Onyebuchi embodied our theme through his social justice efforts through the written word. Tochi Onyebuchi is the author of the young adult novel, Beasts Made of the Night, which won the Nomo Award for Best Speculative Fiction Novel by an African. Its sequel, Crown of Thunder and War Girls. He holds a BA from Yale and an MFA in screenwriting from the Tisch School of the Arts, a master's degree in droit économique from Sciences People, and a JD from the Columbia Law School. He is currently a guest faculty at Sarah Lawrence College, and Raya Baby is his adult fiction debut. Without further ado, Tochi Onyebuchi. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Highline College, for having me, and a, a huge shout, shout out to, to Doris Martinez, to Betty Vera, and, and everyone who has been working so hard to put uh, this incredible Unity Week uh, together. Um, it's an honor to be here uh, and to and to speak on some matters that, uh, as a writer, as somebody who who traffics in uh, imaginings and and you know imagined futures, uh, is very important to me. Um, so I want to talk about dystopia. Um, an anthropologist travels twenty light years from Earth to arrive at a place called Saint Anne. It's a colony planet, part of a dyad. Its sister planet is Saint Croix. Now, Saint Anne was originally settled by French colonists who were then later supplanted by other humans, supposedly. Our anthropologist arrives on Saint Anne looking to excavate the past. Popular history has it that the French, upon arrival, wiped out the aboriginal population of Saint Anne, as is the want of such people. This anthropologist believes at least some trace of the original race exists. And soon after his arrival, he hires a young boy, allegedly half Aboriginal, to assist him on his quest. Because the anthropologist refuses to believe that any peoples could be so systematically exterminated as to leave no trace of their having existed. Pyramids, sunken cities, linguistic fragments, there has to be at least some evidence. The anthropologist and the boy embark on their journey, encountering all manner of science fictional flora and fauna. And at some point, we learn that the anthropologist has come to disprove a hypothesis. In the story, it's called Vale's Hypothesis, and the hypothesis is this. The original inhabitants of St. Anne weren't wiped out. In fact, they were a race of shapeshifters who assumed the form of their would-be conquerors and then proceeded to slaughter them. Suddenly, in a world of interstellar travel and oversized bear cats and clones, are shapeshifters the thing that beggars believe? Suddenly, it's a valid proposition. What if? What if the original inhabitants of this planet were shapeshifters, are shapeshifters, who saw invaders killed them, and stole their identities. We follow as our anthropologist makes a path through this world and are forced to question everything until at some point in the story, even the anthropologist's identity is thrown into doubt. And we are left asking the question, who is human and who is Abo? Not realizing the trap we have fallen into until it's too late. Who is human and who is Aboriginal? That is the question that animates the colonial enterprise, isn't it? Who is British and who is Aboriginal? Who is European and who is Aboriginal? Who is white and who is Aboriginal? Who is human and who is Aboriginal? The book, The Fifth Head of Cerberus by Gene Wolfe, tells the story of this anthropologist and weaves his story through and around two other novellas, all set on the twin planets of St. Anne and St. Croix and all of them examining in haunting fashion 
the post-colonial project. At the center of these stories of clones and genetically enhanced sex workers and robots is this question, who gets to be human? Crack open any book in the science fiction or fantasy section of a library or bookstore and somewhere nestled near the book's spine or hovering just below the header on your e-reader will be this question, who gets to be human? Whether or not a story concerns elves and orcs, super soldiers drafted to fight in a forever war, a boy who lives beneath the stairs or a reanimated monster, this question or some version of it announces itself. Sure, all of our stories are about us. Whether they're creation myths explaining the origin of the stars or dark, ponderous Oscar bait at the theater, all our stories are about us. But speculative fiction provides a particularly powerful lens. Speculative fiction literalizes metaphor. It allows a story to operate as allegory and reality simultaneously. So Arrival is a movie about contact with aliens, about learning their language, and about figuring out whether or not they mean us harm, but it's also a story about a woman learning how to live with a loss she hasn't yet endured. If we know what's going to be taken away, should we love it with all our heart anyway? Sure, the X-Men are a group of superpowered beings capable of pyrokinesis and telepathy and weather manipulation, but their story is also the story of a people hunted, hated, and feared for what they cannot change. A metaphor, however imperfect, for the weaponization of race. If we're looking at the West and we home in on, say, American publishing, American storytelling, common thought would say the science fiction novel, as it's known today, can be traced back to H.G. Wells with The Time Machine in 1895 and The Island of Dr. Moreau a year later. Go back a little further and we get Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in 1818. In those stories, and the ones that followed well into the early 1900s, we get all the staples. Colonization of foreign planets, time travel, bioengineering. In one 1886 French novel, Thomas Edison builds a friend of his, a female android, because this friend has grown tired of his own wife. It's not immediately apparent to the characters, or perhaps to the author either, who is the true monster of that story. Still, the story most often told is of those stories seeping into the pop culture of the time. Dr. Moreau saw its first film adaptation in 1913, and then we get the magazines. Weird Tales, which published the early work of influential horror writer and noted anti-Semite H.P. Lovecraft. And Amazing Stories, published by Hugo Gernsback in 1926. To give an indication as to how influential Mr. Gernsback was, the field's highest honor is named after him. He is the Hugo in the Hugo Award. Gernsback writes in the first issue, not only do these amazing tales take tre make tremendously interesting reading, they are also instructive. They supply knowledge that we might not otherwise obtain, and they supply it in a very palatable form. For the best of these modern writers of scientific fiction, have the knack of imparting knowledge and even inspiration without once making us aware that we are being taught. What follows is an explosion of space opera and the beginnings of what folks have come to call the golden age of science fiction. Before, these sorts of stories would appear in pulps, the children of the dime novels and penny dreadfuls that came before. Now they have their own magazines. They no longer had to share real estate. And these stories are what you may expect of the time. Lurid, colorful covers. There's a svelte, somewhat Scandinavian hero on the cover. Maybe he shares that cover with an alien. If not that, then a woman. These were adventure stories with sciency bells and whistles. But if you're a young white American male, corn-fed, heterosexual, cisgendered, with a healthy interest in airplanes and a world war in your near future, then these stories are about you. All the things these characters do, all the places they go to, all the saving that they get to do, that's you. 
Those stories are about you. In 2017, at the ceremony for the World Fantasy Awards, Martha Wells gave a speech titled Unbury the Future. In it, she says, the convention defines secret history as tales which uncover an alternative history of our world with the aid of fantasy literary devices, like alternate histories or secret tales of the occult. Secrets are about suppression, and history is often suppressed by violence, obscured by cultural appropriation, or deliberately destroyed or altered by colonization in a lingering kind of cultural gaslighting. Wikipedia defines secret history as a revisionist interpretation of either fictional or real history, which is claimed to have been deliberately suppressed, forgotten, or ignored by established scholars. That's what I think of when I hear the word secret histories. Histories kept intentionally secret and histories that were quietly allowed to fade away. She goes on to speak about the erasure of women and non-binary writers and writers of color from the literary history of this country, whether in the pulps of the 1920s and 30s or from the beat generation. The secret history is the speculative fiction's literary devices at work again, a metaphor describing reality. Because as these young American boys are being primed for war a continent away by books whose covers feature bugs to be squashed and women to be rescued, there's another type of science fiction being written. In 1903, Pauline Hopkins publishes the novel Of One Blood, or The Hidden Self, about a mixed race medical student named Royal Briggs, who sets off on an adventure to Ethiopia in search of buried treasure, because student loans. Mistaken identities, amnesiac damsels, magic, ancient prophecy, a royal family, a daring archaeological expedition, this novel had it all. It is also one of the first novels to articulate a form of Black internationalism, because it not only features African-American characters, but it is also set largely in Africa. On the foundation of a romantic adventure story rests themes of race and the obsession with physiognomy, incest, and racial passing. Royal passes for white, and over the course of his journey discovers the sameness of the human race, and he gets there by embracing his storied African heritage. Also published that same year was W.E.B. Du Bois' The Souls of Black Folk. In the early 1930s, the magazines Amazing Stories and Amazing Stories Quarterly flounder a little bit. Money, trouble, money troubles abound. Imaginations grow stale, but chip away at the literary amber and uncover another secret history. Pauline Hopkins may have been the first African-American to give us a romantic fantasy, and in 1931, we may have gotten our first African-American science fiction novel. It isn't about aliens, it isn't about other planets. The novel figures our own is strange enough. Its author is one George S. Schuyler. Its title is Black No More, being an account of the strange and wonderful workings of science in the land of the free, AD 1933 to 1940. And at its center is a scientific procedure. Protagonist, Max Disher, after having been spurned by a white woman in a Harlem speakeasy on the simple fact of his blackness, reads of a scientific procedure that could result in the complete bleaching of his skin. Black No More claims to be able to turn a black man white. The scientific procedure grows in popularity, throwing the social and economic order of the country, predicated on a strictly delineated racial hierarchy, into bedlam. NAACP leaders with their talented 10th aura, they hate it. Southern segregationists, desperate for a critical mass of other to hate, they despise it. Meanwhile, Max Disher, now Matthew Fisher, wins the white girl. The novel's hijinks involve a potential mixed race baby, a jet plane, and mutilation at the hands of animalistic, atavistic Mississippi whites. Speculative fiction in general, and science fiction in particular, speak to our anxieties. They speak to our pathologies, our worries. 
nuclear warfare, civil rights, racial discrimination, we organize our stories around these concerns. Perhaps if we can articulate our fears, we can render them obsolete. Simply to say them out loud is to leech away at least a portion of their power, which is to say that our science fiction and our fantasy, our speculative imaginings are about our fears and our fears are about us. There's something quantum mechanical about it all. Makes me think of that poor cat. Now what animal has been more prone to the vagaries of human curiosity than Schrodinger's poor cat? Trapped in a steel box that it must share with radioactive chemicals. While physicists in the comfort of their laboratories and armchairs talk about superpositions and wavelengths and quantum systems, and while they wait for the radioactive element in the box to either decay or not, the cat has to know that something's up. As the experiment goes, either the radioactive element in the box decays, triggering the release of an acid that will kill the cat, or the element remains stable and Felix sees another day. Because we are human and selfish, we have to make this about ourselves. So it stands that Felix, his father neglected to name him, so I decided to go ahead, is both alive and dead. He's not a zombie. We're not going to have to Rick Grimes the poor thing, but there's a reality where Felix is alive and a reality where he's dead. And they're both happening on top of each other. And the matter doesn't get settled until we step in. The problem needs an outside observer. As soon as we open the box, the wavelengths collapse and the cat is dead. Or nah. But there might be a way out. The many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Here, there is no wavelength collapse. The observer triggers nothing. The world happens whether or not we pay attention to it. Felix dead and Felix alive aren't simply two options or possibilities. They are two things happening at the same time in different realities. Two truths. More than that. Felix is buried beneath a mausoleum. Felix is right now perched on the back of your favorite couch and ignoring you. Felix is meowing his final meows. Felix is at the apex of his career as a world-class tap dancer. Felix battling a gambling addiction. Felix discovering lasagna for the first time. Felix is dead. Long live Felix. It may not seem obvious just how much quantum mechanics, how much science fiction has to do with blackness in America, but I know for a fact that more than a few of us engage in precisely these thought experiments throughout our day. Mothers of black sons do it every day that they must send their child out the front door because very often Laquan McDonald and Mike Brown and Trayvon Martin and Botham Jean aren't just names or family members or loved ones or former classmates or work buddies or teammates. They are alternate realities. You hear the racist remark in the office and wonder if chewing out the offender is worth the potential job loss. Before you unspools a future where you lose the job you fought so hard to get to begin with, then the delinquent rent, and then the pile of unpaid bills becomes a mountain. Student loan default, eviction, estrangement, but before, that, before all that can be spun into being, you hold your tongue, you save yourself. A million deferments, a million instances where you step aside for someone else, a million defeats, compiled over the course of the day born out of self-preservation. Because as angry as it makes you, what makes you angrier is that recorded video of Philando Castile's last moments after an officer had fired his gun into the car carrying his partner and child. Worst case scenarios are the business of survival. You learn what berries to eat, not because certain ones taste better than others, but rather because certain berries will kill you or at least give you bubbling guts. Certain berries will see you minding your business 
living your life and you'll stoop down thinking this is just a regular encounter with another bushel of berries and maybe these will even taste better than the last bunch. Then suddenly you're on the forest floor, paralyzed by pain, betrayed by a berry that was supposed to nourish you, a berry that was supposed to serve and protect. Basically, berries are cops. <laughs> There's this thing I'm doing right now, and you might look at it and say, oh, he's just laughing through the pain. And I would chuckle and maybe demure, suggesting that perhaps that's too melodramatic a take. The berries thing, what was that? You ask the person next to you. Well, aside from a kind of wobbly metaphor, this thing I'm doing right now is imagining. It's imagining away the apocalypse. It's articulating a fear, engaging in science fiction as act. It's trying to survive the dystopia. Dystopia comes from the Greek, and as night is the opposite of day, it came on the heels of the term utopia, its opposite, translating quite literally to the bad place. The word dystopia brings to mind autocracy and tyrants, mind control, environmental disasters, subjugation. In dystopias, books are burned and heroines must volunteer as tribute. In dystopias, words are stricken from the spoken language in the hopes that the ideas they hold will vanish as well. In dystopias, androids are birthed into lives of automatic servitude, always a slave. I'm thinking in particular of Blade Runner 2049. In the movie, our chief antagonist, played by Jared Leto, seeks to build a workforce that self-replicates. Machines that give birth to other machines. Algorithms made flesh. It is unclear whether Jared Leto's character understands the full implications of capturing the power of birth and therefore engineering our own obsolescence, all in a quest for an ever-expanding workforce. Even devoid of racial animus, Leto operates in the shadow of the slave master, commanding his chattel to copulate and create born slaves whose entire purpose is to generate profit. Twitter rides a wave of hate in order to appear as though their user base is ever increasing. Never mind that a significant portion of those new accounts are automated bots. Facebook finds itself similarly situated, governed by an id so avaricious, it turns even altruism into a mere act, a performance. Are we making money in order to advance the human race or are we advancing the human race in order to make money? If our present reality has told us anything, it is that our future will carry all of our present societal pathologies. In fact, it may even aggravate them. Our future will be racist, it will be sexist, it will be virulently misogynistic. As long as the white cisgendered males currently writing our algorithms remain in power, Jared Leto's transhuman mock messiah is far from the least believable part of Blade Runner 2049. The imagination need not stretch far to touch the hem of this Jack Dorsey, Peter Thiel, Jeff Bezos hybrid's garment. He is our terminus. Algorithms used in police departments and health services purporting to wear the majestic neutrality of faceless machine precision have been shown not only to reinforce racist and patriarchal dynamics, but in some cases to expand their ambit. Ask an algorithm to calculate bail for two detainees of different races. Ask an algorithm to gauge a patient's risk of suicide. And then there's the black box so impervious and whose contents are so unimaginable that to watch an algorithm at work is to be in dialogue with another species of being. A dog staring at a human, knowing that it is capable of thinking, of figuring things out, and yet who remains forever tragically unintelligible.
the future is in the hands of white male chaos agents disguised as visionaries who more often than not are not forced to submit their source code for public examination, for scrutiny, for comment, and thus build our 2 b unchallenged and unpunished. Facebook morphs into a platform for the spread of misinformation, easing the consciences of those enacting genocide on Rohingya Muslims. Twitter, the chloroform-soaked rag, silencing the already near-silenced, marginalizing the marginalized. These makers believe they're at work constructing a utopia. If a foreign power cyber attacks its way into a presidential election, if a woman of color is harassed off a social media platform, if SWAT teams are maliciously sent to the homes of innocents by way of hoaxes and prank calls, it's chalked up to the cost of doing business. For them, it's the dirty soiled present they intend on leaving behind. But for the rest of us, it's the future we are being dragged into. The nightmare of dystopia doesn't lie in the carmine shade of lightning that cuts through small gray clouds overhead or the hungry way ocean laps up against the gigantic walls surrounding our cities. The nightmare of dystopia isn't even the elephantine garbage carrier disgorging waste onto the hidden homes of orphans. The nightmare of dystopia is its inevitability. Every fantastical story is about our now. When Hugo Gernsback wrote in the pages of amazing stories about the type of story he sought to publish, a charming romance intermingled with scientific fact and prophetic vision, he was elaborating a vision of the genre that sought to will the imagination into being. New adventures pictured for us in the scientific fiction of today are not at all impossible, he writes, of realization tomorrow. Many great science stories destined to be of historical interest are still to be written. Posterity will point to them as having blazed a new trail, not only in literature and fiction, but progress as well. There's the temptation to read into the genre a sort of prophetic mandate, especially when our own times seem so dire and surreal. Commentators wasted no time drawing comparisons between the Gilead of Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale and the inauguration of the current president of the United States, a figure who many say saw its prefiguration in Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower. The marketing, the marketing team behind this president wasn't the first to coin the phrase, make America great again. Look to Fahrenheit 451 and see a metaphor for the current valorization of anti-intellectualism and the denigration of expertise. Maybe the signal quality one looks for in a leader isn't a facility with foreign languages or the ability to hold macroeconomic concepts in their head. Maybe it isn't the capacity for expansive geopolitical and moral imagination. Maybe it's simply that he seems like a nice guy to have a beer with. Before the thought police made their appearance in Orwell's 1984, there was the Tokubetsu Koto Kaisatsu, established in 1911 by the Empire of Japan. Waterworld, Westworld, climate change, artificial intelligence, in each version of the post-apocalypse, the fear that drives the narrative is that of our own obsolescence. In the future, our being human will not be what saves us. In fact, our being human is what doomed us to begin with. We are chained to the, action, to the consequences of our actions. But these visions often assume a monolithic human folly. There's this idea that we, all of us, in our respective rooms or in what would have been the room we shared, deserve what happens to us equally. That we all deserve this prison of the future. Like all living things, we resist enclosure. Deer roam forests, vines colonize abandoned coliseums, 
A human being held in solitary confinement will self-harm, scream, plead, kick doors, smear feces on their cell walls, and refuse food if there exists even the promise of seeing the sun for 15 minutes of their day. There are many words in English for what that human being quests for. Liberty, emancipation, freedom, independence. So much of the American project has been dousing its cultural fabric in these colors. Justice is nowhere to be found, and peace somewhere far off in the distance, over the horizon, in fact. Those messy words presume an after, and they presume that this after is other than post-apocalypse. An episode in the second season of Black Mirror titled White Bear dramatizes precisely this conundrum. The protagonist, a woman played by Lenora Crislow, awakens with amnesia, haunted by a symbol that flickers on the television screen in her room and hunted by unreasoning pursuers. People on the street catch sight of her and immediately raise their camera phones to record. Even as her pursuers shoot at her and those who have decided to aid her, the spectators remain just that, spectators. They're being held captive by a signal from a transmitter at a facility called White Bear. Get to White Bear, destroy the transmitter, and free the world from their stupor. When she and her confederate reach the transmitter, two hunters attack. In what is supposed to be the episode's climax, she she rustles a shotgun away from one of her assailants, aims, and pulls the trigger. Out comes confetti. The whole thing was a hoax. Her name is revealed, as well as the fact that she and her fiancé had murdered a child, her sentence for which is daily psychological torture. Relive the same day over and over and over again, with no memory that it has ever happened before. Emancipation, with no hint of peace. Some would watch the aftermath of that reveal, the woman being driven back to her compound while those spectators from earlier curse her and damn her and spit at her and say that's justice. They might say that in punishing her, whatever justice system that exists in the world of this episode is simply operating out of procedural fidelity. Maybe the algorithm decided this and an algorithm sees neither color nor sex nor gender nor faith. It renders us equally as numbers. But of the many things I came away from that episode holding in my chest, nowhere among them was any sense of justice. Black Mirror places the episode somewhere in our future, an after, as it were. The paradox of progress here is that it takes our imaginations to create an after where there are no afters, revealing the mistake inherent in founding your identity on the sole item of liberation. The light at the end of the tunnel brought to you by lamps that have been hung up in the next portion of the tunnel. If your organizing principle is freedom, maybe all you've done for yourself is fashion another cage. And a cage does not need metal bars and concrete walls to be obvious. Once again, science fiction allegorizes our prison. I should have said allegorizes our present, but for too many Americans, there is no difference. In Flint, Michigan, the water is still poisoned. A global pandemic has wreaked particular havoc in the cities, the neighborhoods, Black Americans and Latinos call home. The data has become increasingly assertive of the notion that we are not all on the same boat. Some of us take shelter in the safety of our yacht, while others are forced to share a single piece of driftwood. Surveillance capitalism has already partnered with law enforcement throughout the nation so that resistance movements can be quelled while they gestate in the womb. In meeting rooms throughout DC and state capitals across the country sit men legislating away the control a woman might have over her own body. Put this all in a book and you'd be forgiven for thinking that this unreality was simply the product of an overactive imagination. But the reader, when confronted with the truth of these conditions, must ask, for whom is this dystopia 
and for whom is this reality? Gernsback's idea of scientific fiction as a story intermingled with scientific fact and prophetic vision becomes especially chilling in this light. What Gernsback could not have imagined was that the children and grandchildren of empire might also be engaged in these imaginings. They might also be at work constructing alternate nows to critique this one and imagining new afters. We see the fruit of their labor in Afrofuturism. UX designer and theorist Florence Okoye writes, Afrofuturism dares to suggest that not only will black people exist in the future, but that we will be makers and shapers of it too. She ties the Afrofuturist project to a reaching back Far from operating from the blank slate baseline that results from the wholesale obliteration of one's history by the triangle slave trade, we can reach back to our past to inspire our futures. We've snatched the pen, the tablet, the laptop from the hunter and type out with our claws the true story of the savannah. Oppression seeks to pulverize the possible, to atomize hope, to granulate not only dreams but the very act of dreaming. What control does one have over the slave, the sharecropper, the convict in a capitalistic enterprise if they can imagine another now? If they can build in the cathedral of their mind an after? Now, better to erase their name, indicate only their present physical features on the bill of Leyden, amputate their familial bonds by scattering their children into plantations all over the country. A century later, however, rappers walk the streets of New York City with Africa pendants hanging from their necks, at work knowingly or unknowingly repairing American injury, telling story the way Schuyler told story, the way Butler told story, the way N.K. Jemison will tell story. Afrofuturism, this imagining of afters, pushes the laborer toward the tunnel's mouth. That warmth? the feel of the sun on your face. Prison still persists. Environmental racism aggravates illness. Material and professional advancement will still be thwarted, but there is nothing like the moment when a prisoner the first night of the 1971 Attica uprising stares up at the sky from a D-yard crowded with other prisoners crafting a civil rights moment and says, tears leaking down his face, that he hasn't seen the stars in 22 years. We resist enclosure. Speculative fiction speaks in the language not only of what is, but what can be. In fact, speculative, fric speculative fiction breaks down the walls between those two. In the work of Neon Yang's Black Tides of Heaven, your gender is the result of your choice. In the recent... TV miniseries adaptation of Alan Moore's Watchmen, God takes the form of a black man and is hunted. In The Fifth Head of Cerberus by Gene Wolfe, an indigenous peoples allegedly murders their would-be colonizers and turns into them. All of these things can be read as fantasy and all of them can be read as true. The genre's primary concern was never technological advancement it was human examination. From Pygmalion to Planet of the Apes, all of these stories posit the question, who gets to be human? Reading dystopia as a black American can often feel like being confronted with a constantly lived truth, that everywhere contains peril, and that there is always immediate cause for mourning. This is that apocalyptic imagining Speculative fiction often speaks in the language of end times. You spend your whole life gathering evidence, informing the worst case scenarios that you cannot help but constantly imagine. And if the fundamental denial at the root of race hatred in the United States persists, then maybe apocalypse is all there is. I do not believe we can stop them, Samori, ta Coates writes to his son in Between the World and Me because they must ultimately stop themselves. 
White supremacy will never go away. Its victims will never fully escape its reach. In every galaxy we travel to, it'll be there waiting to be warred against. Life is reduced to an eyes blink existence inside a steel box while a poisonous acid is being released. In every variation of this equation, the result is the same. We are Felix, Schrodinger's cat, and we never survived the box's opening. But that's not all there is to the story. Afrofuturism, the work of Pauline Hopkins, the satire of George Schuyler, this appropriation of the medium by the children and grandchildren of the empire, the secret history running like a third rail through our past and our present, that is the other part. It is this thing that gives my pessimism texture, fills it out, wrinkles it, enables me to believe that the universe, this one at least, is ordered out of consideration for me, is molded with me as its subject. In essence, I get to be the hero. Believing this doesn't necessarily mean believing in a universe where you will never suffer harm or loss, a universe where everything is fair, where the cosmic ledger is balanced. It can mean sacrificing oneself to a higher calling or duty, prioritizing others, family, community, etc., over oneself and finding fulfillment in that. Believing that the universe is ordered around you as subject can look like watching an autumn sunset or standing outside in the winter and listening to the feathery snow suck up every single sound so that there's nothing but that beautiful charged silence wrapped around you. It can look like an appreciation of nature for everything from the ladybug to the goshawk. Sometimes it looks like submitting to the limits of your understanding and admitting you have no idea what the hell is going on. Always though, we're trying to find some way out of the box some way that keeps our head on straight and air in our lungs. Sometimes that looks like writing fiction. And sometimes it looks like us replacing the anthropologist and proceeding to tell our own story. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tochi. Um, I'm sure if you could see everyone, everyone would be applauding and they'd be very um, happy. And um, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, community, we will now take a 10 minute break for you to get up, move around, um, get to class if you need to, take, get a drink of water. Um, and then after those 10 minutes, we will commence with our Q&A session. Um, if you do have a question for Tochi and Yabuchi, we ask that you please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. Thank you. Welcome back, Highline family. We will now resume with questions for Tochi. We have some great questions, but please feel free to submit more in the questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen as we move along. All right, let's look at them. All right, so the first one that we have is not a question, but it is coming from Shaiwan Haynes. She says, no question, but wow, this is dope. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and our first question is from a, one of our students named Maya, and they're asking, which book has been the most influential on your world view, Tochi? Ooh. Oh my goodness. Um, oh man, there are so many, so many sort of candidates for that, for that title in part because, you know, there, there are certain books that have really burst my, my worldview open with regards to, um, you know, race or with regards to international issues or with regards to gender or what have you. Um, but I will say in terms of just sheer possibility, I would have to point to The Count of Monte Cristo, oddly enough, by Alexandre Dumas. And the reason I picked that book is because I, I remember reading it in high school and Dumas was my favorite writer at the time. Um, and still to this day, and still to this day is. Um, but it wasn't until 
junior year of high school when I was doing study abroad that I actually found out he was black. Like I had no idea. Like the dude who wrote Three Musketeers, like arguably the most famous French writer in history, um, no shade to Victor Hugo, um, was the same color as me. Um, and I think that really, that really drove home a, an interesting point for me because, you know, it's important what's in a book, but I think also too, with regards to representation, um, perhaps what has been even more powerful for me has been seeing who has, who has been writing these stories, right? Like, I knew for a very long time that I wanted to be a writer, that I wanted to tell stories, and that I wanted to tell all types of stories. And uh, to, see, to see a guy like Alexandre Dumas write a story about, like, you know, you know, hidden identities and buried treasure and revenge plots and all this like really, really, really cool stuff. There were like sword fights, all of that stuff. Um, that really blew my, my mind open with regards to what was possible uh, in the world because it, it made it seem like I was possible as a writer. Um, so yeah, I would, uh, that's a somewhat long-winded answer to, to yes, um, The Count of Monte Cristo. Okay. The second question comes from Paul Sam. It says, thank you so much for your knowledge. I learned so much from this talk. I'd like to think of myself as an aspiring writer. I am an international student from South Sudan, and I want to write fantasy, but African fantasy. How can I tell a story? How can I tell stories that are unapologetically African? I have this fear that a majority of people are not as ready to receive real African and Black stories unless they are diluted in whiteness. Oh man, that's so real. That's such a real, that's such a real concern. I think it's, we're, we're very, this is a very interesting and I think really promising moment for speculative fiction and even just fiction in general that concerns itself with the African continent. My very first book, Beast Made of Night, was uh, the, the setting is very much inspired by Lagos, and particularly the Lagos where my mom grew up in Nigeria. And, you know, you look, for instance, at uh, the recent novel by Marlon James, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, which is set in this sort of second world the, you know, uh, sub-Saharan fantasy Africa. And that was like shortlisted for the National Book Award. And then you, ha you look, you know, across, you know, whether it's young adult or, or adult fiction, you know, Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi, um, which is the first in her trilogy. You look at Ray Bearer by Jordan uh, Ifueko. Uh, there, like, there's so much incredible work that's being put out by African and diaspora writers. And, you know, granted, there's, it's, it's not enough. Like, there's, oh, there always needs to be more. But I will say now more than ever that, you know, it's possible to go into a store, to go into a library, to look on a shelf and to see um, a story that, you know, science fiction or fantasy that engages seriously with the continent. Um, that gauges seriously with issues that are endemic to to African countries, to African peoples, that you know takes you know, Africanness seriously, um, and that wasn't always the case. You know, I I think you know one of the people that I think of um, immediately with regards to the intersection of Africa and speculative fiction is Nnedi Okorofor um, and her Binti trilogy. Uh, that like you know. Uh, look no further. Um, and basically just everything that, that Nettie does, you know, she's very much career goals for me <laughs> with regards to the trail that she's been able to blaze for, for Nigerian American writers. Um, but yeah, and, you know, while it's a legitimate worry um, that, that stories that are, that are sort of unapologetically African will be diluted by, you know, a publishing machine that is majority white. Um, let's not forget. I do think that, you know, there is cause for hope um, that if you if you stay as true to your vision as 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 you as you are able to, um, there is an audience for that. Awesome, thanks. 
So our next question comes from a student named Jalissa, and they have asked, how are some ways that you recharge yourself after having to constantly know and encounter and encounter oppressive structures that are steeped into humanity? Whew. <laughs> Video games. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's such a, that's such a real and important question in part because, you know, as, as somebody whose writing is infused with, you know, these sorts of issues and concerns and what have you, I'm constantly having to stare this stuff in the face, right? And it can be exhausting. Um, it can be exhausting just living through it. And then it can also be exhausting on top of that, trying to engage in the sort of alchemy that turns that that pain and that trauma into a work of art that somebody can relate to. Um, it's, it's always a blessing to have your peoples, you know, just have people that you can, that you can laugh and be joyful with and that you can crack jokes with that you can watch, you know, Netflix shows with that, like, you know, people that you can go to. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be, you know, people that you can have heavy conversations with. It can just be people that bring joy into your life. Um, that, you know, that is definitely something that I've tried to make sure has been an ample supply in my life. Um, but also too, um, you know, just having things that, that allow me to extricate myself from the work. So, you know, I, I was laughing earlier about video games, but I am dead serious. Like video games really like that. Uh, I'm playing, I'm, I'm playing, um, a game right now, Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice. And it's very much like a Dark Souls, Bloodborne type game, notoriously difficult. And if you saw me playing, you'd be like, wow, that doesn't look relaxing at all. That, in fact, looks like the most stressful thing that I have seen you do all week. But it's something that's not, you know, engaging with, you know, deconstruction of oppressive colonial structures. So in a way, it is it is a sort of relaxation. It is a way to sort of get my head out of that space. And it is something that I can sort of lose myself in, which is, um, I think, you know, at the core, what I'm looking for when I'm looking to sort of detach from the work that I'm doing. Um, and it, you know, it keeps me sharp. You know, it's like, uh, it's like Sudoku, in a sense. Um, Remy Friedrich. Um, asks, you mentioned that you were pessimistic about what will happen in the future. If you were being optimistic, what do you think will happen? What will it take to get us there? Oh, man. Uh, shouts out to optimism. Um, I love optimism. Um, I think it, if, if, I were, if I were to engage in my most optimistic vision of the future, it would be that that there that that you know that it would it would entail a sort of breakdown of racialized capitalism right so you know one sort of concrete manifestation of that would be okay we no longer you know no longer tie your health insurance or whether or not you have health insurance to whether or not you're employed right and then you look at that and you look at all the ways in which that has sort of all these these racial vectors when you look at the job market for instance and you look at who has what jobs and you know whether they're full-time part-time what have you and how health insurance is tied into that and immediately you're confronted with this sort of this entanglement of of capitalism and all the sort of ways in which racism has structurally manifested itself in the workforce and in society and whatnot and if there was a way to just sort of like tear that all apart and make sure that, you know, no matter what color you were, no matter what your background was, you would be able to be medically taken care of in this country. Like that would be, that would be really, 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 really dope. Um, yeah. I, I like, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like the things that I, that I would be asking for would be like just super basic things <laughs> like, like, like universal childcare, like, you know, uh, not having to, you know, that, that every single person in this country would be free from worry, right? Like, you know, food insecurity or home insecurity, like th that they wouldn't have to worry about that sort of thing. Like that's, like, that's, that's it for me. Like I, you know, I could, 
I wouldn't need spaceships or I wouldn't need, you know, you know, androids or any of that stuff. But just like if we could get rid of food insecurity in this country, like that would be really, really, really cool. Um, I do think we're seeing steps in that direction with, um, you know, aspects of the of the left amongst our legislators, both on, on the national and on the state level. And you see in terms of like state politics, a lot of really good organizing going on, but also too sort of outside of the political realm, a lot of organizations that are doing work with regards to indigenous rights, with regards to um, gun violence, with regards to uh, incarceration, with regards to bail reform. So much work is being done so much good work is being done and it's the type of good work that doesn't it's it's not showy it's not flashy it's not the type of stuff that you would that you would hear about or that you would see people like tweeting about even um but it's getting done so um you know it's not you know those those visions it's not that far out there um it is possible uh and i think we're i think we're on our way there All right. So next question, which books or concepts would you personally recommend to someone who wants to learn more about speculative fiction? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Where to begin? Ah, oh, this is such a delicious question, but at the same time, <laughs> this is just so many. Um, I would say if you're, if you're interested in the ways in which speculative fiction can look at and deconstruct sort of oppressive structures, um, but you also want a story that is just incredibly well told and that just has all these incredible mind busting like world building details. I would say read the Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. So the first book in that is the fifth season. And let, let, let's just put it this way. Every single book in that trilogy won the Hugo Award for Best Novel. And N.K. Jemisin is the only author to have ever pulled off that feat, to win the Hugo three years in a row for, the, for, for Best Novel, and also to have every single book in a series win Best Novel. And it is all deserved. It is all deserved. That is how good those books are. Um, I would say, I would say check, check that out. Also, Ted Chang um, is the like master of the speculative fiction short story and, and novelette. Um, I mentioned Arrival earlier in my remarks. That is an adaptation of the Ch Ted Chang story, Story of Your Life. Uh, and uh, he most recently had another collection come out, Exhalation. And he is, and it's interesting too, because you look at N.K. Jemisin and you look at Ted Chang and, you know, stylistically they may seem like you know like like opposite poles on the same spectrum but really they're they're at work doing similar sorts of things with regards to using speculative fiction um as a a method as a vehicle for human examination um you know getting back at this question like what makes us human and who gets to be human um that i think is at the core of what both of those writers are doing and they they are absolutely peerless when it comes to speculative fiction. Aisha asks, I'm thinking about your final point of white men writing our algorithms, and I'm wondering from the perspective of science fiction, which addresses or reveals our anxieties and fears, what would you name as the current anxieties, fears of white men, and how can we disrupt and ultimately heal these anxieties for a bit better future for all of us oh man well i think i think we're seeing we're seeing a lot of that stuff how it plays out online like one thing one thing in particular that i think about a lot is with regards to twitter and harassment right and also too tying that into uh the gamergate movement the Gamergate um, was this this campaign that I think reached ahead in 2015, and it had been sort of building. Um, but basically, it was this campaign of uh, harassment, of online harassment, um, against these these two women in particular, um, who were uh, women who were reviewing video games, 
And it started out, or ostensibly it was about, uh, and this became a bit of a punchline, um, but uh, ethics in gaming journalism. That's what, that's what a lot of the proponents said it was about. But really, uh, it was this backlash to what a lot of people saw as the increasing diversification of people in the gaming industry, and also much more largely in science fiction and fantasy fandom. So basically, it was this backlash against there being more people of color um, prominently featured in fandom, um, you know, backlash against, you know, you know, women and non-binary people uh, reviewing games and making and creating games and, and all of that. And the way in which all of that was very much facilitated by the way a platform like Twitter is built, right? Um, the way in which you know, harassment is reported or dealt with or what have you is very unwieldy when dealing with the type of targeted campaigns that those sorts of, of, of groups and those sorts of movements engage in. And you see that dynamic replicated in so many different ways um, throughout our platforms. You know, there, there are parts of, of Facebook that are like that. Um, and I think, I think the, it's it's becoming increasingly difficult for a lot of these these founders and what have you to plead uh, ignorance of these blind spots, right? Or to say that they're working on it and not really like do anything about it. Um, more and more people are really calling them to task for it. But I do think it's a very persistent thing and that gets at this issue of like you know diversity in tech like who's writing the algorithms who's in the room making these decisions and and who's coding these things who's preparing for these eventualities um you know jack dorsey when he often is asked about the issue of harassment because people like often ask him about harassment on twitter um he'll talk about how like nobody on his team saw this coming when they first like started Twitter, like when they first you know started out with it. Nobody saw this sort of thing coming. But if you're a person of color online, you you would have known from the jump that this would have been something to expect. Um, so that I think is is that I I'm I'm very curious to see how how that is dealt with moving into the future, this conversation surrounding the blind spots of a lot of these people that are sort of put in charge of this sort of thing. I'm not quite sure if that answers your question, but I hope it does. All right. So the next one we have for you is what are other books to, um, con to look to when this person is um, beginning their understanding of race and class. So if someone is beginning their understanding of race and class and the intersections of those concepts, what are some books that they should start with? Oh my goodness. Um, oh man. Uh, whew. Definitely the new Jim Crow. Um, that is that like, that's, that's a fantastic book about uh, the way in which race um, intersects with incarceration um, and particularly like that vector of, of race relations in, in the country. Like it's a very sort of salient dimension along which um, the issue of race is, is examined in America. I, I'd also recommend um, The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. Um, that is a book about the Great Migration, basically the the mass migration of Black Americans from the Jim Crow South up through and to other parts of the country. And the way that the book is structured, it it takes the bird's eye view from like thirty thousand feet in the air, but it also tells these individual stories. And through these individual stories, you get a a you get these like you know glimpses of the larger pattern and it tells this incredible and gorgeous story about america and it does it through the and you know it gets into why these people were moving from the south or moving from where they were moving and it goes into like what was waiting for them when they got there and so i i think those two books the new jim crow and the warmth of other sons are are two they they shine their light on two different aspects of the the way in which race happens in this country um 
but it's sort of all along the same continuum. And also too, that's just to sort of show that, that there is such a multiplicity of experience, right? So, you know, with regards to black Americans, it's not just about like jail and prison. And at the same time, it's not just about like, you know, Jim Crow. It's about all this other stuff, all this other stuff that we're having to deal with in our life or all this other stuff that brings us joy or all these other ways in which we relate to each other. Like that's, um, that I think is really, really, really important. I'm blanking on a few other titles, but I would also recommend um, the poetry of e-viewing, actually. Um, Electric Arches, but also most recently um, her collection, 1919, um, which I believe is titled after the year in which there was a a um, race riot in Chicago. Um, the e- Eve's poetry is incredible, and the it just she's able to get into all these different aspects of the black experience, particularly black childhood and and black girlhood, and like I think between those three books like that I think you're going to be off to a tremendous tremendous start and also too like those those writers are not shy about the writers who have influenced and informed them and so those will be really good windows into the work of other writers as well the next one reads thank you so much for sharing today what inspired you to pursue your MFA in screenwriting and writing Do you have advice for others who may be interested in pursuing a degree in writing or other creative fields? So I, so I knew ever since I was a kid that I wanted to be a writer, Um, but I grew up in a Nigerian household. So (laughs) so it's, it's, you know, the, the, the four career paths that were available to me were doctor, lawyer, engineer, and then disgrace to the family. Um, So I figured, let me split the difference. Uh, I, I, you know, went to law school, but actually um, got into law school and the MFA program at the same time. And then law school let me defer for two years to do the MFA program. And so there was always that caveat, like mom was like, okay, it's cool for you to get this little MFA because I know you're going to law school afterwards. (laughs) Uh, But uh, the reason I got the MFA that I did, and I got it in dramatic writing, so screenwriting, um, playwriting, and TV writing, um, and I got it, I I got it in that field because I'd been writing prose for so long already at that point, and so I, you know, I knew how to write a novel, I knew how to write a short story, I could work my way around, you know, prose fiction. But I had just, towards the end of college, gotten into screenwriting. Like, I, it, I, it was very late in life that I realized that, peop, that there's actual writing that goes into, like, movies and TV. I had no idea that this was a thing until, like, way too late in life. Um, but also, too, I found out that it pays way better than, than being a novelist. So I was like, you know what, let me, let me, let me try this. Let me try to get good at this. Um, so... I will say probably the the biggest benefit was that for two years, my my main focus, pretty much my only focus was writing. And that had never been the case for me before. I was always negotiating writing around all these other obligations. It was high school, college, like, you know, work, law school, whatever. And so for two full years, I got to do nothing but write. And I wrote a ton. And that was very, very, very instructive. Um, in terms of advice, I would say, you know, more than anything, just love writing um, because then the, the, the time will, the time to write will find itself um, because people are always asking me, Toshi, when do you, when did you find time to write? Like, how are you writing and doing all this stuff, this other stuff while you were in school and et cetera, et cetera. And I don't, I don't know that I have an answer for that because it's not necessarily that, oh, I woke up you know, super early every morning and that was my writing time or, oh, I stayed up super late and that was always my writing time. No, like my writing time was whatever I had time. <laughs> uh, but what are the part, part of the reason it was that way was because I loved doing it. And so whenever I could do it, I was doing it. And also too, the thing about the thing about that being the piece of advice that carries you through is that there's just so much rejection involved, like so much rejection and so much nonsense. Like one, one book, one book that I was shopping around at one point picked up rejections from 40 different agents. 
Like it didn't even make it past like the agent. It, it, it didn't even get me an agent. No editor ever saw it. Like it, it barely got past the query stage and it's like 40 rejections for like one book. And that book is one of, I think like 13 um, that I wrote at various points in my life and tried to, tried to shop around. So there's just like, so, and, and, and that was the thing was like, it took me from when I like decided I wanted to become a published writer to when my first book actually came out was about probably like 15 years, maybe a little more than 15 years. And it was just like 15 years of straight rejection. And if it was any other line of work. If you're being told no for 15 years and like, Oh, Tochi, this ain't it chief. Like usually that's an indication that you should find a different line of work. Like that's, you know, you're maybe this isn't the thing for you. Right. Like if you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to become a pipe fitter and 15 years of, of trying to become a pipe fitter and you're not fitting pipes the right way, maybe you just ain't got like, maybe that's just not it for you. Right. Um, but I just loved writing so much that it never even occurred to me to contemplate not doing it. Um, because whether or not I was published, I was always going to write. Um, and I think that for me was the, the, the most important thing, um, was figuring out like how, to maintain that. And so when people ask what advice, like that's, that's the only thing I feel comfortable, like giving in terms of advice, because everything else is sort of your mileage may vary. All right. So next, this question is, what is your advice for people that would start, would like to start exploring fiction and fantasy writing specifically? Um, what would be a toolkit for beginners? Oh, man. Um, I would say just just read what you love and try to figure out why you love it, right? So I think there's, you know, I think one thing that will come in handy is really critically examining your own reading habits. Um, why do you feel drawn to the things that you feel drawn to? Um, and that, that isn't just reading, but also movies and TV. Like, why do you like the movies that you like? Why are you drawn to the TV shows that you're drawn to? Um, and try to sort of unpack the answers to that. Uh, and then once you get down to that, that'll start you thinking more mechanically about storytelling and about why certain things work for you and why certain things don't work for you. And that, in a sense, is sort of a self-generated toolkit, right? Like I, I'm very wary of, of books that are like, okay, here's how to write a novel in 30 days, right? Because, <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a lot of snake oil salesmen um, that, that, you know, are trying to, that, you know, have, have made an industry off of, you know, folks' desperation, but really it's, so much of it is about learning yourself, right? Um, learning who you are and who you want to be as a writer. Um, and it's like with, with, you know, the old painters, you know, you got good at painting by, by copying the people you admired. Um, and so I think, you know, figuring, figuring that out, figuring out why you like what you like is probably going to be the best way to get started in terms of building that, that toolkit. And this will be the last question. <laughs> Amazing lecture, but one question I have for Tochi is what work do you do and why is this topic important to you? Oh man, I, so I am actually like finally a full-time writer. <laughs> uh, it's been, it's been about a year and a month. Um, but before that I did, uh, I did uh, some work at a tech company. And then before that I did work in uh, civil rights law, particularly with regards to incarceration. So uh, after law school, I worked for the New York state attorney general's office with their civil rights bureau. Um, and basically our job was to enforce federal state and local civil rights laws for the entire state of New York. Um, and a lot of that, you know, there were, there were, you know, employment discrimination claims that we would investigate. Um, you know, we did a lot of work with regards to reentry. So people that were on parole or on probation and just trying to sort of reintegrate into, into society, sort of easing their path. I did a lot of work with regards to solitary confinement, particularly of juveniles in the New York uh, jail system. And like, that's, that's a distinction that New York shares with North Carolina is they are the only two states that 
um, will allow 14 and 15 year olds to be tried as um, or to be imprisoned as adults um, or to be tried as adults when incarcerated. And uh, I got to see those literally kids in cages. Right. And so I did a lot of work with regards to examining that issue in New York County jails. Um, and then after that, I moved to uh, the Legal Aid Society and their parole revocation defense unit, which was essentially uh, criminal justice, but for parolees. And that entailed basically living on Rikers Island. Um, I spent so much time there. It was, it was ridiculous. And it was very, it was very taxing. It was immensely rewarding work, but it was so taxing that I knew very early on that I just did not have the stamina to do this like long term. At the same time, I saw a lot of stuff there that I wanted to talk about. Um, particularly the the humanity that happens in places like that, right? Like there's this idea that a place like a place like prison, a place like jail, it's all just like, you know, people indulging in their worst like basis instincts. But no, like there are human beings there and there's so much incredible like the whole spectrum of the human experience can be witnessed in over the course of like twenty-four hours in any sort of facility, carceral facility across America. Like there are, there are people like in love, there are people like, you know, negotiating friendships. There are people like dealing with all types of stuff, like from back home, people trying to build new lives for themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Like all this stuff is happening in this very charged environment. Look at even just the relations between um, you know, the, the incarcerated and prison officials. And you'll all, you'll, automatically notice this sort of multiplicity. You know, why do some people get along with this one CEO versus this other CEO? Why does, why does this person feel like they have to assert themselves a particular way, but this person may automatically have other people's respect? You know, what, what does it mean that for, for, for these guards to come from this particular, like, city versus, like, this particular community? What does that mean for the, like, all these different things are going on um, with regards to human relations. And, I wasn't seeing any of that reflected in the books that I was reading or in the TV or movies that I was watching. This was all really fascinating and important stuff to me. Um, and so that is one of the ways in which the work that I did before has made its way into what I do now. And I hope I can, I hope I've been able to, to do justice by some of those folks. Thank you. Well, this concludes our presentation for today. Again, thank you to Tochi Onyabuche for your wisdom and your powerful message. Um, in the chat feature, you will find a link for our Unity Week survey. Your feedback is critical in enhancing our programs and we would greatly appreciate your feedback.